All right, thank you all for sharing this evening with us. I know it's a rainy night, and some of you drove from really far away, as, as far as John Brown University, actually. So I uh, hope you all got here safely and also get back safely. Um, so Emma mentioned this is the first time that Veritas has been hosted in the state of Arkansas. I, I was corrected by an elder statesman that uh, 1990, there was actually was a forum here. Um, we don't know who it was. Uh, we'll find out. But we'll just say this is the first one in the new millennium in the state of Arkansas. <laughs> Um, so these, these forums helped me when I was in college. I was, I was once a young lad, and uh, we, we sometimes hold separate lives in our own heads, right? Between the things that we study at school or the work that we do on one hand, and sometimes we hold those distinct from the beliefs or faiths that we grew up with. And it really takes a lot of personal time and effort and really questioning yourself to be able to reconcile or unify those views. So hopefully tonight can be um, just the beginning of opening dialogues internally with yourself, but also hopefully uh, with others um, uh, and considering views that you hadn't uh, thought about before. Right. So now introducing Dr. William Hurlbut. I met Bill in 2018, which feels like a lifetime ago, uh, when I was procrastinating on my PhD dissertation. Right. <laughs> we all do it. Um, and I saw this really seductive advertisement for a class that promised Ray Kurzweil would uh, be a guest speaker. All right, so of, of course I was curious to meet Ray and, and hear his latest prophecy for how we're gonna be overrun by computer overlords. And uh, so I took the class, Ray never showed up, and <laughs> I finished my dissertation one year late. <laughs> so two easy lessons here, right? Uh, first of all, false advertising does work. Uh, I, got, I got my butt in that seat for 10 weeks. And yes, even your college professors procrastinate. We've just learned how to procrastinate productively. All right, it's a really important skill. Um, but, but more seriously, uh, Bill's class on neuroscience and ethics was really useful for me because in science, right, we're taught to pursue um, explanations of phenomena in the world that can lead to predictions, um, that can lead to control. And not control in any nefarious way, right, but control in ways that we can solve real problems that, of society, right? And I think a lot of students here can appreciate that, you know, you spend a lot of your uh, life um, pursuing those goals, right? And I guess sometimes you need classes like that that really zoom out where you can start to see that sometimes asking why is as important as asking how or obsessing about how to solve a problem, right? So hopefully tonight can start that little internal monologue in you. And we're really honored to have Dr. Hurlbut here. Um, briefly, just introducing him. Dr. Hurlbut is an adjunct professor in neurobiology at Stanford University. Uh, he also completed his undergraduate and medical degrees at Stanford. Um, and he spent many years thinking and writing about um, the ethical issues that new biotechnologies uh, were, were creating, all the way back since the uh, 90s and early 2000s. And he served for eight years on the President's Council of Bioethics under uh, George W. Bush. Um, and that was just a role that kind of inspired me because uh, I, I would hear him talk about how he could integrate his deep knowledge of medicine and science with his personal faith. And really to use those things to advise actual policy issues that impact um, uh, our, our country. Right? So we're lucky to have him speak to us tonight about uh, the forthcoming gene editing technologies that can profoundly change, really control human development. So please give me a warm, uh, please give him a warm welcome. Thanks, Josiah. It's been really fun hanging out with him t today. Um, thank you for coming out in the rain. I, I love it. We haven't seen rain in California for a long time. So um, I thought it would be interesting to start with this slide. Um, it, it's a poster from a conference I spoke at at Harvard sometime before um, the pandemic. And um, editorial aspirations, uh, human hands, what Aristotle called the tool of tools, um, the symbol of our distinctive body form and unique capacities of mind our comprehension, creativity, and control over the natural world. And nowhere is that control more dramatic and more significant right now than in our control over genetic editing. Those hands are now turning to operate on our very selves. So what I wanna do is talk with you 
in broad terms about biotechnology, but I want to use genetic editing as the way in. And what I basically want to say in summary is, in summary is that we've gone from the era of molecular biology, um, which is continuing, but that was the main focus of the 20th century. And once we had the human genome figured out, we could now start to ask the question of how do those gene products, the proteins that genes code for, weave together the living human organism. So we're entering a very, very interesting era with great challenges and great opportunities, but many perils in terms of ethics. So whereas molecular biology can be done in a test tube to study um, developmental biology, you need organic process. And one of the ways and the, the most accurate way is within the actual organism themselves, which means research potentially on human embryos. So I spent a long time, as, as I said, on the President's Council during the stem cell debates, and I want to draw on my experience there and illuminate for you what I think some of the answers for a moral way forward and some of the pitfalls and dangers that we're entering into actually are. So it's a new era of genomic engineering, what MIT Tech Review has called the biggest biotech discovery of the century. Most of you know this, CRISPR is an acronym. It's a um, immune mechanism in, in um, bacteria to protect themselves against viruses, but it's cleverly been deployed as a gene editing tool. Um, it's been called molecular scissors, but more rightly, it's just like a Swiss army knife because it's so versatile, there's so many things you can do with it. Basically what it is, is a stretch of RNA that latches onto a piece of DNA, an identifiable stretch of DNA, and then there's a thing called an endonucleus which cuts the DNA, or you can swap out all sorts of tools on that portion of it and do a whole range of things to both DNA and RNA. So it's very useful, and scientists are inventing a whole new toolkit of operations with this versatile uh, up, um, new biochemical um, tool. So that, that's sort of where it's at, and, and it's very dramatic. Jennifer Doudna, who you all probably know got the Nobel Prize a year ago for this, um, says, advances in gene editing are enabling us to rewrite the very language of life. So what can we do? Well, I'm gonna go through this quite quickly, so most of you know this, especially in a school with a strong agricultural foundation, but um, we can alter fruit and make them um, more nutritious. We can uh, improve photosynthesis in, in specific plants. We can add genes that allow us to produce kilogram quantities in large vats, of course, of, of um, Drugs, anti-cancer drugs, for example. We can alter um, pigs so that they, we remove their retroviruses so they are suitable um, for organ transplantation. We can alter their organs to make them more compatible with human beings. So essentially what CRISPR-Cas9 is is a knockout or knock-in kind of tool, and it can operate profoundly in, in, in almost any circumstance and all living nature has vulnerable or accessible aspects that we can apply this tool to. But the most interesting and the one I want to talk to you about today is developmental biology as it's applied to human beings. And, and as a physician, that's what I think about mostly. And, and this is an amazing moment. If you go back a little bit to 20 years ago, there was major controversy over embryonic stem cells. The idea was that stem cells could be engineered to evade immune rejection and therefore are suitable for universal transplantation. But we couldn't quite do it because we didn't have these tools. And the, the hope of the whole era of developmental biology was, was tied in intricately with cell therapies. But now that we have CRISPR-Cas9, we can make very fast forward on that and the whole investigation of developmental process. Unlike other gene editing tools, it's cheap, quick, and easy to use, and it's swept through labs around the world. There have been literally thousands upon thousands of, of um, scientific papers published using this new tool. And just to give you some idea how, how dramatic this revolution is, I'm friends with Rudolf Janisch at MIT who did the first recombinant mouse 
And he said to, to change one gene, it took him two years, it was Tosok, of course, he didn't do it, but two years, $200,000, one gene. And I, just before COVID, I had dinner with him and he said, now I can do it in three weeks for $2,000 and change, you know, dozens of genes at once. So really amazing tool and it's leading to dramatic new insights into, into uh, theoretical biology, but practical applications. Eventually it's gonna be very, very, very significant for biomedicine. So Jennifer says, we're standing on the cusp of a new era, one in which we'll have primary authority over life's genetic makeup and all its vibrant and varied outputs. And what have we done? Well, earlier, Gene Tool, we added firefly genes to make mice glow in the dark, and somebody did an art project turning a bunny that glow, glow in the dark. Scientists have taken the melanin gene or disabled it in, in salamanders and created albino salamander. I think it's, when you think about what simple gene changes could do, um, for example, Barriers between species, mating barriers, are often just relatively few or even maybe a single protein. And if you can alter that, we might be able to have whole new hybrid kind of creatures. Um, and, and I think between that and operating on the developmental process of, of creatures, we might end up, by the time you guys have kids or at least grandkids, you, you might take them to the recombinant zoo and have a whole new set of creatures to to show them, um, Dr. Zeus, he's been canceled his literature, but maybe he'll be real life Zeus now. Um, and also there'll be possibilities for producing chimeric creatures um, or hybridized creatures that, that are really useful for biomedicine. Don't worry, this is just a drawing, so that doesn't exist yet, but it's not out of the question that we might be able to blend creatures in special ways. We learn a lot of developmental biology that way, but also raise strange questions. They're already transferring genes into, into animals, as most of you know. Scientists in, in China have put uh, human genes into monkeys to make them smarter, sort of, in some parameters, but less good in others. It's not as simple as it sounds to some people. Of course, this has a very deep history. A hundred years ago, the Soviet Union tried to make the human Z and the, the, there's actually a quote, I don't put it in here, I forgot, but from Stalin, he wanted his scientists to create um, soldiers that would not complain about the food and be more versatile, you know, the kind he wishes he had for dealing with Ukraine today. But um, instead he's kind of recruiting all sorts of old grannies and poor people <laughs> out of prisons, it's terrible. But um, that, that's the kind of agenda that people can come up with, a human Z. Meanwhile, in, reputable scientists are actually talking about the possibility of de-extinctioning human species, uh, Neanderthals and Denisovans. Um, maybe that'll be possible. One of my friends, George Church, is working to try to resuscitate the re de-extinction the woolly mammoth. Um, others have suggested that if we're gonna actually venture out into space, um, we'll need to engineer uh, through genetic engineering, perfect astronauts. I don't know if this would be germline or just temporary alterations, but um, you can imagine if we're really gonna get serious about going to space, we'll have to have some different biochemical alterations. Um, I'm, I'm a little pessimistic about that project, by the way, we can talk about that later, but uh, I don't think it's gonna be as easy as it sounds. Um, anyway, and then of course there's all sorts of projections. I think this is a joke, but somebody suggested that we make smaller human beings like about the fifth of size. Think how many people we could fit in a dormitory if they were just a fifth their size. How many resources we could save. I, I doubt that's gonna go anywhere. One of my fellow members of the President's Council, Francis Fukuyama, wrote a book, Our Post-Human Future, and most of you know there's a whole movement on campuses, probably right here too, um, called the Transhumanists. They, they're talking about um, longevity research to, to extend the human lifespan, human, animal, chimeric, cyborg creatures. There's, there, there's all sorts of agendas. It, and, and of course, now there's serious money pouring into figuring out how to extend the lifespan. Um, serious scientist William Hazeltine said, the real goal 
in biotechnology is to keep people alive forever. The transhumanists, that's part of their thing. You get, this is their motto, H plus. The students, you all know what that means. Better humans. And Yuval Noah Harari, who's a graceful and entertaining writer, um, has said, um, sapiens will upgrade itself into another kind of being within a couple of centuries at most. Earth will be populated by beings who are different from us in their cognitive and physical abilities. I actually doubt that. I'd like to debate that guy, because I think he's a little out of his depth when he talks about biotechnology. Um, anyway, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think so. So getting more serious, um, there are very, very positive uses of this technology, and Jennifer Doudna says we're, be, we're at the beginning of the end of genetic disease. So let me explain to you how this would work very quickly. This is a blood smear of sickle cell anemia. You see the little sickle-shaped cells. Normally, blood cells are biconcave discs. They're smooth. They flow even through the smallest capillaries very easily. But if they're in an environment without as much oxygen, they tend to clump because they get sickled and then they catch on each other. So what they're doing is they're going in, and there's several different ways to do this, but they take, withdraw the stem cells that form the blood, they mobilize them into the bloodstream, they, out of the marrow, they withdraw them, they put them in a dish, they alter the genetics, and they put them back in, and they find their address again in the, in the um, bone marrow or thymus, and they, and they grow, and they produce healthy blood cells. And that's looking really good. It's looking very, very possible, like this will be the, your generation will be the one that cures genetic, this terrible genetic diseases. Disease, when I was a med student at Stanford, I took care of a little boy who was 11 years old, and he was in for his 200th hospitalization. And it's a suffering existence for those those people, and it would be a wonderful thing to cure that. Um, but mind you, that's, that's somatic cell. That doesn't go on to the next lineage, uh, next member of the lineage, so they have to do it in each generation. But that's where most of the research is going right now, and it's very constructive and very hopeful. And using special kind of viruses that can target particular tissues, we can even get get to deliver the CRISPR molecule with its transformative power right into specific tissues, including in, in tissues in the brain. So there are very, very many possible prospects. And by the way, there, there are at least six to 8,000, probably tens of thousands of un, yet undiscovered single gene genetic diseases, 95% of which have, have not only no cure, but no treatment even. And some of them are pretty bad suffering. This little guy has Miller's syndrome. Most genetic diseases manifest as a syndrome, and I'll tell you why that is. Syndrome means there's multiple expressions. This is another genetic disease called Kreutzfeldt-Jakob, and these little fellows they chew their fingers off and their lips off. There's a metabolic deficiency. And it's really a pretty terrible disease. So if we could cure it, that'd be a wonderful thing. But that raises a strange question. Where, what is serious enough to risk and the expense to cure? And would, what would we want to do? What's, what's going on with this? Is it an albino? Is that, is that a, a disease or is it just a variation? And um, what about this? If we, somebody just, parents just simply want to have a child with some color eyes, blue eyes is what you usually hear, but uh, could be anything. Um, would, would we do it? Would we allow it? Well, maybe, but it won't be that easy because most traits are caused or at least influenced by many genes. Turns out that there's two things, principles, you probably, most of you know this, some of you know this, polygenic and po polygeny, polygenic inheritance and pleiotropy. Polyg most genes, most traits are caused by many genes, that's polygenic inheritance, and most genes affect many traits. So genes are really like, they produce proteins, and the proteins are like primary colors that are, like colors on an artist's palette before they actually make their way onto the canvas, they're mixed. And so for most traits that we care about, like intelligence, beauty, longevity, there are many, many genes involved, in some cases hundreds and maybe thousands. So if you alter it to get one thing, you'll get multiple things like a syndrome because genes do many things in any one individual. There are a few traits you could probably get if you really wanted to, like red hair. It's caused by one or a few genes. 
But Harvard geneticist George Church has figured out that there are some traits in the human genome that he calls rare protective variants of large impact, which exist naturally, but only in a relatively few people. And he suggested that we might want to genetically engineer these into the larger portion of the population. He's got a whole list of these, including stronger bones, lean muscles, less sensitivity to pain, low odor. I'm not sure what that one's about, but anyway, there it is. Um, and then there's, you know, like you can imagine if COVID is, if we can't get over it, maybe we'll genetically engineer people to avoid viruses in some special way. So you can see there's, there's pressures and possibilities operating here. Um, nonetheless, thoughtful guy, Stuart Newman, uh, New York Medical College says, this will open the door to attempts to pick and choose characteristics, what is normal anyway, and various families will be willing to take different risks. So it raises immediate social questions. It raises another really profound question, and that is, what exactly is a disease? And what's a human variation? And what, how do we manipulate our sense of what diseases are? This is a famous slide. I'm sure you've all seen it. This, this, is a, this fellow in the antebellum south, um, pro probably right here in Arkansas, in the textbooks, they had this disease listed as drapetomania. It meant the, the tendency to run away. And of course, his treatment, in quotes, was to be whipped. Imagine, imagine encoding such a cultural phenomenon into your medical textbooks. But that's not, that's not just 150 years ago. That's within the lifetime of some of your professors. The uh, Nazis did similar things. And we know all where that led. I'm not even going to dwell on it. It's so horrible. But it raises profound questions, doesn't it? Uh, what is OK to do? What, what agendas of perfection are we aiming at? And why, why would we justify them? Or why would we oppose them? And then you could say, well, we, we won't do this. We'll just keep it to serious conditions. But that's not the way our society is moving right now. If you look out at medicine, there's all sorts of new so-called lifestyle interventions. The Roman physician Galen said the physician is only nature's assistant. But now consider what we're using medi medicine for. It's a new paradigm, one of liberation from all that's unattractive, imperfect, or even just inconvenient. And, and look at where we've gone with this. Um, we got Rogaine, that's uh, for treating baldness. Male pattern baldness wasn't even a, considered a disease or disorder when I was a medical student. Um, but there it is. It says, if you're concerned about hair loss, see your doctor. But quickly they moved from the medical um, distribution to Costco. And you have Costco down here in Arkansas? It's, anyway, it's, it's, it's like a uh, discount store. And now you can buy it over the counter or anywhere. So in the small type there, you probably can't read it, but it says, if you're losing your hair, you no longer have a reason to lose hope. So imagine, does that, what a clever kind of advertising pressure they're putting under people as though it's some kind of a stigma to lose your hair. But that's the way our society's going. We've got growth hormone for small people. We've got a whole range of interventions from the pills, birth control pill to Viagra, to a lot of so-called nootropics um, that can change mental capacities and behaviors. None of these are easy to do, and they all come with downsides, which I'll talk about later. But the point is that people will be vulnerable to the persuasion of, of what some people hold as, as better babies. And, and um, I mean, who doesn't want a healthy, happy, and, and very capable child? So, um, by the way, we did, a, we did a volume in the President's Council, which is very well worth reading, I think, still. It's called Beyond, Thera Beyond Therapy, Biotechnology and the Pursuit of Happiness. If you go on, on um, President's Council on Bioethics, you can get it online. It's, um, I think, the best thing we did. But there's a lot of temptation for this, better brains, better bodies. And it's all very mechanical and very, very mathematical. It's no longer science fiction. It's reducing human beings to their molecules and to their processes. And it, it's 
at some level is going to be effective, I guess, can be very seductive in its promise anyway, but it's cold and it treats human beings in a different sort of way than we're used to, um, sees them more as products. So realizing this was a serious issue, Jennifer Doudna called together a bunch of scientists and organized the first international summit on gene editing and in 2015. And just before that, scientists in China announced a genetically modified human embryos, albeit they were embryos that couldn't implant and successfully development. But there was a lot of talk about the usefulness of this as a new tool. To address complex diseases like cancer, we must carry our investigations, investigations to the most fundamental elements of living systems. That's my professor from med school, Paul Berg, Nobel laureate. And he, he says we should ignore those, those issues. They're not ethical issues, he says, but because they're embryos. But that's what they are, and, and a lot of people disagree with that. I disagree with that. So others, Dean of the Medical Center at Harvard says gene editing could also be used to engineer specific disease-related mutations in an embryo, which could then be used to produce embryonic stem cells that could act as models for testing drugs and other interventions for disease. So you can see there's a huge push to use, to create embryo models, genetically engineer them, knock a gene out, see what it did, knock a new gene in, see how it changes things, um, study the effects of pharmaceuticals and environmental toxins, all sorts of things that could be very useful scientifically if there were no ethical concerns here. So this is about where it stood in 2000, end of 2015. And soon after that, Jennifer Doudna and I organized a four-year project doing doing um, convening scientists to talk about these ethical issues. It was, a, it was a difficult conversation, very, very deep and illuminating. Um, and before our very first conference, um, Jennifer emailed me and said, we, we only have one scientist from China coming and, at our conference in a few weeks, and, and there's this young fellow coming from China that maybe we should include him. And I said, sure, let's do that. So this guy came, his name was, um, and, and I was the convener, so I was busy you know, with everybody, trying to make sure everybody had a good time. And, and, but I did get to know him a little bit. And then a few, few months after the conference there, I got an email from him saying, can I come and talk to you? I'm coming through Stanford. And so, so I said, sure, let's meet behind the student union and the sunshine in June and Stanford is so beautiful. And we'll, we'll have lunch and I figured, well, I'll go back and have, get some work done in my office. I didn't have anything scheduled that afternoon, fortunately. So I met JK, that's his nickname, JK, at, at behind the union. And the first thing he did when we, when we started talking was he said, you served on the President's Council. You, you, this idea about embryos, people objecting to embryo research, that's, that's just like a little splinter of people in America, right? That's, that's a kind of crazy idea of fanatical people. And I said, no, JK, the, the, half of Americans disagree with the use of human embryos for research. And the other half, whatever they think about the human embryo, are m m mainly excited by the science. They, they're not necessarily thinking about the embryo. And so he, he found that baffling. And he, he held up his fingers like this, and he said, how can something that small be as important as my little two-year-old if she got sick. He had a two-year-old daughter. And I said to him, JK, your little two-year-old was once that small. So that's the poignant question. That's the, that's the issue that is now going to confront us. And it's starting to happen. I was just in Washington 10 days ago and had pretty deep conversations with people in the Congress. And this is a picture of of um, JK, and this picture is quite a famous picture because JK kept coming back to see me and finally came in October 2018 and he said, I have a really important paper coming out. And I said, oh no, J don't tell me you implanted human embryos. I could just feel it. And, and he wouldn't tell me anything. He said, no, no, it's gonna come out in early next year. And, and, and it, it's interesting in all this. Well. I was pretty worried about it. I'd been warning him he should not do that because he'd humiliate himself, his family, and, and his country, and, and science as a whole. So he wouldn't tell me, and we spent all afternoon talking, but he just talked about other things. And, 
A month later, I was on my way to Hong Kong for the second international gene editing summit. I got a call from Antonio Regalado from the MIT Tech Review, and he said, what do you know about JK? And I said, oh no, don't tell me. <laughs> he said, yeah, he's implanted embryos. He I found, Antonio said he found a filing for it, and I think they've been born. So I bought the Wi-Fi all the way across the Pacific, $34, and it didn't work. But uh, finally, a month, uh, about an hour out of Hong Kong, finally clicked on, and every headline on every newspaper that came up had germline edited twins born in China. This is a major moment in human history. And in fact, actually, think of it, it's a major moment in the whole history of life. For the first time, a creature was able to find the technological means to control not just an individual patient, but the whole lineage. We were at the cusp, it was a hinge of history. We were there ready to transform the human species by our own mechanisms and our own, to our own meanings. J.K. himself was a very, is a very nice guy, actually, and um, I, uh, there he is in my dining room, and he tried to take the gene out of, a, uh, for, for HIV, it's a gene called CCR5, so that it, some patients of, of people with some little children of parents with HIV wouldn't get it. And, and he had very good reasons in his mind for doing it, but it was a huge mistake, and it caused a, an enormous uproar at, at the um, conference. And by the time he spoke a couple days into the conference, he had an armed guard, and he told me he was getting thousands of emails threatening his life. Um, I was supposed to have dinner with him the night after he spoke, but that never happened for obvious reasons. Anyway, I got home after this huge tumult of, of um, news people and everything at that event, and um, he, he emailed me again and said, could I talk with you? So we had a long series of conversations on, on the phone, two, three hours, and in one of them he told me he'd gotten an email from, from a fertility clinic in Dubai, and so th this says, uh, congratulations on your recent achievement of the first gene editing, and basically what they wanted was to teach, teach them how to do it. Well, we already have stem cell, offshore stem cell clinics, and they're just downright dangerous. I mean, they're killing people in some instances, or maiming people, plus fleecing people of enormous amounts of money. So you can imagine the, the consumer population for gene editing, especially with all the genetic diseases, plus the promise of better babies. So th this is a very serious matter, and I, I, I think the governments of the, of the world need to take it very seriously. I want to now just spend the last couple of minutes um, before we have conversation to tell you a few of the challenges I see coming from all this. Well, first of all, there's the embryo issue, which I think is a very real issue. Those are, that's a picture of leftover so-called IVF embryos that are, there's, you know, there's a couple million of them in cold storage in the United States. I'm friends with a guy at the lab who runs the, the, um, the IVF lab arrangements and, and years ago, even, it's been a decade or so, he took me into a, a room where there were these huge vats of liquid nit nitrogen and little like straw-like things with embryos down in, the, in these big freezing containers. And um, th there were at least a dozen of these things and hundreds of embryos in each, in each um, of these vats uh, occupying a fa fairly small, tight room, but they were all clumped together. And I, I said to him, to my friend, boy, that must be the densest population in human history. Um, all those little embryos. Of course, some people don't think they're human beings, but they are, in fact, the earliest stage of human development. Their moral value is controversial, but in continuity with life, it's reasonable to say that they should, not, they should have the same inviolability as other human beings. So my, my own, this is a very tense debate back when the stem cells came up because they were using leftover IVF embryos to obtain the stem cells. My own alumni magazine pitted this as a conflict between science and religion. Well, that wasn't fair because it wasn't, but still, that's the way it's been caricatured. The, the, um, the meaning of this is really quite deep. Um, 
the science is a very positive force in our world. And I, I'm a physician, and I, I think I'm very much in favor of using science to improve life. But I also think we need to do it in the light of, of a larger wisdom and a larger perspective so we don't degrade and devalue human life. That is also the opinion of the U.S. Congress, who has specifically sustained a law. It's not actually encoded, but it's, it's an amendment every year on the uh, budget. It's called the Dickey Wicker Amendment, and, um, and it, it forbids the, the use of federal funds to, for anything that destroys or endangers a human embryo. And that's, by the way, what the controversy is about on the federal level. A lot of states allow embryo research, and you can do embryo research with private funds in a lot of states. Some states fund it, like California. So it was a huge controversy back in 2001 and the succeeding years. I took this off of a political poster for, actually it was for those who wanted to, to advance embryo research, but I thought it could equally be applied to a pro-life perspective. We fight because lives can't wait. Um, one's referring to the patients who need the therapies, yet the other could be referring to the embryos whose lives are eager to get going. Um, so this is what a, I mean, you can see why it's a controversy. This is what an eight-cell human embryo looks like on the sharp tip of a pin. That's how small it is. But small isn't actually a measure of, of moral meaning. Um, if you think about it in terms of the dynamics of development, that tiny, th almost microscopic entity goes on through powers that are intrinsic to itself to develop through the various stages of human development starting with fertilization, early cell divisions, and it's not very long before you get to about this stage. I, th I would guess that's about um, five or six weeks, maybe, maybe a little earlier. And then, then there's the fetal stage, and then there's a little baby. And it's all the powers intrinsic to the embryo itself. It doesn't even have to be in a womb. You can, there's abdominal pregnancies. There's a famous case of a a pregnancy that took place in the base of the liver. As long as there's good blood flow, it can happen. And, but this was still a very bitter controversy because people recognized, especially the scientific community, recognized that we were entering a new era, that there were new possibilities for biomedical intervention and great scientific advance. So it was very bitter. And, and um, it's hard actually to appreciate it right now how bitter it was. But uh, at the Democratic National Convention, the, the son of Ronald Reagan, a Republican, stood up at the Democratic National Convention and said, we've got to advance this embryonic stem cell research because it's going to cure 150 million Americans of their diseases, which was truly hyperbolic, as history has proven. But it was that, that's the weight that was on everybody's shoulders. So some people were advancing this. I want to show you this, a political ad from 2006. And in case you think the politics is bad today, just check this out. Next summer, I'm going on a camping trip with my friends. On my way home, I'll be in a car accident and I'll be paralyzed for the rest of my life. In 20 years, I'll have Alzheimer's. I won't recognize my husband or my kids. Next week, my mommy and dad here are gonna find out that I have diabetes. This is my congressman. Congressman John Sherwood. He voted against federal funding for stem cell research. Is he a doctor? Is he a scientist? Why did Congressman Sherwood bet my life that he knows best? Help me. Help me. Who knows? Maybe I'm your mother. Maybe I'm your grandson. Maybe I'm your little girl. How do you know I'm not you? Stem cell research could save lives. Maybe yours or your family's. Someone you love. Only Congressman Sherwood said no. How come he thinks he gets to decide who lives and who dies? Who is he? Majority action is responsible for the content of this advertising. So uh, I'm not sure what happened to poor old Congressman Sherwood, but I don't think it was a very fair ad. You know, you can make practically any argument on human suffering, and that's the problem. But the suffering, whereas it is something we want to address in society, it's not the only evil, and it's definitely not the only axis of moral principle. And that's where the, the trouble with an ad like that is. 
So what we need to do is find the good way to go forward and way that is both moral and, and opens for positive science. So just for the last couple of minutes, I, I want to just show you, lay out what I think the parameters of that are. So this is uh, interesting, uh, uh, an old Chinese saying, those who choose the beginnings of a road also choose its destinations. So we need to make, we need to start our science with the right premises, and we need to go forward in a way that's moral from the foundations. Otherwise, we'll build future science on immoral practices. And so this raises four fundamental questions. Based on our history, will we now, because at the time of the embryonic stem cell, it was just about using leftover IVF embryos to get the stem cells. But now we endorse the use of human embryos for a wide range of, of other studies of infertility and early development, many, many things we could do. Second, will we allow the creation of embryos, not just use of leftover embryos in clinics? Um, Will we create them specifically for research purposes? And as I said, that's Rudolf Janisch. He made the first mouse, but there's many, many purposes. We could create embryos, alter them with genetic engineering, and study them. And as I said, some questions about early human development can only be addressed by studying human embryos. At least that's the way George Daly saw it at that point. That may not actually be true now but at least that's the argument, and that is a pretty strong argument because if there were no moral issues, you'd want to do it. The third question is how many embryos, if we are gonna create them? I mean, some people would say, oh, just a few embryos, that'd be okay because we'll learn such an immense amount. Well, one Japanese scientist made 581 copies of the same mouse through cloning, and you would want to do that because we, and we can, by the way, make human clones embryos. No one successfully implanted them and developed a baby, but you can make cloned embryos, and you can study them for at least a few days and see what the genes do. And you, the reason to do clones is because then you have a stand, more or less standardized comparing one thing to another with the same genome. And so the, right now, the, the the bottleneck on that is the number of human eggs because it's a dangerous prospect. I would, I personally would never advise anybody to be super ovulated to give their eggs, you know, for, for research because it's dangerous and it's not a certain number of women have very bad problems after it. But, um, but if you could take embryonic stem cells or the, or the ones created in a lab now called induced pluripotent stem cells, you could perhaps coax them to become eggs because we can produce different kinds of cell types by altering the environment that the cells are growing in. And one thoughtful scientist said, today you can't experiment on human embryos because it's considered morally repugnant and they're difficult to get. If human embryos could be grown in culture like any other cell, they, this problem would disappear and they'd become like any other cell line, they'd become objects. And someday we might hear that somebody made 20,000 embryos and studied their development and we just say, well, that's okay. But now the really, really profound question is, um, will we allow research on embryos beyond the 14-day principle that operates not in the United States, but in the United Kingdom and China and a variety of places? And, and that's, that's been put forward as an absolute red line, but now, just a year ago, the International Society for Stem Cell Research said we should transcend that because there's so much good science to do and we can now keep embryos alive longer than, than 14 days. I know of a circumstance where they're at least kept alive 20 days already, and they were aiming for 26 when they were doing that experiment. So what, what would, would we ever do this? Well, my own colleague from Stanford served on the California State Commission and said, oh, 14 days, that'd be the, that would, won't always be the limit. We, based on future understandings that might come from neuroscience. Well, neuroscience? I mean, what's he thinking of? What finding in neuroscience will tell you it's okay to use a human embryo? Well, the head of the bioethics center at Stanford agreed, and he said, we can use embryos up to 26 weeks of gestation because they don't even have a nervous system. He's absolutely wrong about that, by the way, but that's the kind of statement you hear. So a lot of very strange stuff operating. And some people devalue the, the, the fetus in the developmental stages and say that it's a lot like plants. Others say that, that um, different traditions in different countries have different attitudes toward embryos and fetuses. In China, I gave a talk at 
at Brenman University for their 60th anniversary celebration. That's the original Communist University. And the chief bioethicist from China responded to me and said, that uh, in China, we, we obey the 14-day rule because that's the international convention right now, but we really wouldn't have any problem doing later stage research on embryos and fetuses because Confucius said that you're not really a person until after your birth. Well, a, a, a philosopher scholar came up to me afterwards quietly on the side and whispered to me, that's not what Confucius said, but that's the party line right now. So you can see China very likely is advancing this kind of science on that basis. Um, but there are written legitimate controversies worldwide over what the status of the human embryo is. But there is pressure now, even within Northern Europe and, and um, America, to change, transcend this 14-day principle. Now, what would that mean? Well, there's lots of things it could mean, but one thing it would mean is you could potentially develop embryos and then harvest out parts, not just study them, but actually use them as repositories for, for spare cells, tissues, and organs. And I want to tell you a story about that, because believe it or not, 30 years ago, that's a long time in biotechnology, I was, I was teaching at Stanford, and, and uh, one of my friends was working in a lab south of the the campus because they wouldn't allow this research on the campus, but they were taking fetal parts from abortions and putting them into the abdominal cavities of so-called skid mice that won't reject them because their immune system has been rendered inoperable. And, and I was walking through the, the, this biotech company with my friend, and he lifted up a test tube from a bench and said, look in there. And I looked down in there, and there was a little human hand about three-eighths of an inch across in the bottom of the test tube. And I said, where did you get that? And he said, well, we took a little tiny snip off of a very early aborted fetus. What happens is the fetus starts out like a trunk, and then a little bud comes off where each limb is going to arise. And, and then as that bud goes on, it develops um, and extends as, as a uh, hand, and then a, as an arm, and then a hand. And he said, well, we snipped that little bud off of a four, uh, just got a couple more minutes, about a four-week-old fetus, put it in the abdominal space, and it grew. And we opened up the mouse, and there was that little human hand. Well, I looked at that little hand, and I thought, wow, that's amazing. Someday, maybe we can produce hands for people with amputations. But then I remembered that was actually going to be somebody's little hand, that little hand that, that, that um, lays across mother's breast while it feeds, and that little hand that you grasp your fingers. And it was very poignant to see that. And well, would anybody do this? Yes, there's, they're working on it. They're, at least they were last I checked. Um, and one bioethicist says it's morally required that we do it, that it's the right thing to do. Not only that, but there's a company, or at least there was a few years ago, in Silicon Valley that's trying to make this into a commercial operation. Moreover, there are people, I'll skip this, but um, there are people working on creating artificial wombs to develop embryos farther and farther so they don't even have to go into a woman's womb. And, and I have a bet with a Stanford embryologist that, that she thinks that there'll be a completely artificial womb baby fully gestated baby within 10 years. I don't think so. I told her, let's bet $10,000, and she only wanted to bet a dinner. So maybe she's not so sure. But that shows you how serious things are. And just one last point. There are other ways to do this. We now have organoids, amazing powers of stem cells. If you develop them to a certain stage and mix them together, they self-generate cells, tissues, and organs that are of later developmental stages. That's a very hopeful way to do this. I'll talk more about that in a minute, but uh, including cerebral organoids. Just to close, I want to show you a, a, a statement from Leo Alexander, who wrote the Nuremberg Code um, after the Nazi doctors in, in uh, Germany violated human dignity. He said, the beginnings at first were merely a subtle shift in emphasis in the basic attitude of the physicians. 
So it all started from small beginnings, and that's why we need to be careful we need to find the right beginnings, otherwise we might end up like the Nazis. Even the co-discoverer of the double helix regarded that we should, newborn infants should be, be allowed to be put to death if they don't meet certain standards of human development. Well, that's pretty cold-hearted. Famous geneticist from Columbia University, Erwin Chargoff, said, science is now the craft of the manipulation, substitution, and deflection of the forces of nature. What I see coming is a gigantic slaughterhouse, an Auschwitz, in which valuable enzymes, hormones, and so on will be extracted instead of gold teeth. What is madness? To have erroneous perceptions and follow correctly from them. We're at a critical juncture in human history, could lead in widely different contrasting futures. So back to those hands. We need to be in touch with that deep forces of wisdom, the deep spiritual containment that guides and aligns our life to proper good. Where Niels Bohr said, we are both actors and spectators in the great drama of existence. So hopefully we'll find ways to go forward with this, ways that are honoring to our species and honoring to human life. C.S. Lewis once said, we should answer all of our problems with more love, not less love. I think that would be a good principle to operate on as we go forward with biotechnology. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot for that, Dr. Hurlbut. Uh, I'm only gonna ask one or two questions because we're a little over time and we'll open it up to the audience for questions, right? So I think the first thing that we could ask to get context is um, what were your recommendations on the Council of Bioethics um, to George W. Bush um, on the use of stem cells for research? And how did that transpire? And now what are the, the new rules that, that uh, might have replaced what you recommended in 2002 to 2009? The, 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 the council deliberations were very difficult, just like the whole deliberations in the larger society. And they, President Bush actually appointed a council of diverse voices. He wanted, he knew that these issues transcended any one era, and he wanted to make sure that we had the best thoughts and the, the full range of thoughts um, when he put together our council, but the result of that was that there was a lot of disagreement and it was quite d difficult. And we never did arrive at a perspective that we could agree with by consensus on the meaning of early human embryonic life. So we did have other good things, as I mentioned that that um, volume called Beyond Therapy, That's that we got a lot of good out of that. So difficult is the simple word answer to your question. Got it. And and so if you could recommend uh, current President Biden, pretend you're on the Council of Bioethics right now, and say um, your summit with Jennifer Doudna, what would be the one, I guess, edge that you would want to create for the proper use of gene editing techniques on, um, on answering, on, on manipulating human DNA? I, I can't quite hear this echoing. I couldn't uh, quite echo, hear your yeah. question. But say it again. Yeah, if you could make one policy recommendation right now on the use of gene editing technologies, what would it be? A recommendation for how to go forward? Yeah. Well, what I was going to tell you at the end was, it turns out that if you take embryonic stem cells or the, the artificially created equivalent, which are called induced pluripotent stem cells, you don't need to get an, have an embryo to get those. The induced pluripotent stem cells work very well, and you can put them in a chemical environment that induces them to develop to a certain stage. So for example, scientists have taken induced pluripotent stem cells, coaxed them to become the early cells of the placenta, the extra embryonic membranes, and one of the early stages of embryonic development, mix them together, and they form, in the dish, they form self-assembling human embryos that have many, if not all, of the marks of a natural human embryo. So you know, it looks like you may not need sperm and egg anymore to get a human embryo. You may just need stem cells 
coaxed to a certain stage and mixed. But the positive side of that is that, and by the way, I, I'm of the opinion that if, if something could be implanted in the womb and you, you could get an identifiable human being from that process, we should consider that to have moral inviolability. Um, if we don't take that principle, then we're gonna have an endless series of arguments and no one's gonna, there's not gonna be consensus on when the line is, what the line is. And there's gonna be, in my opinion, a lot of very repugnant developments that, that are challenge, gonna challenge people's sense of human dignity and, and, and cause a lot of disagreement. But, um, but if it can't develop, maybe it's not an embryo, that's reasonable to say that. Um, but, but the thing is that if you take certain stem cells and put them together, you don't get a whole embryo, you just get certain types of tissues. And they're, they're learning how to create all manner of partial trajectories of embryological development now including cerebral organoids, which produce, some people call them mini brains, but they're not really mini brains, they're just portions of the brain. And, and, but you can mix the right kind of cells together and you can get cerebral organoids that track very closely to the gene expression patterns and developmental uh, form morphology of normal cerebral development. And just, just 10 days ago, my colleague at Stanford, Sergio Pasca, had published a paper that showed that they put these one of these organoids with human tissues into a mouse brain, and it actually integrated with the mouse brain and affected its behavior. So this is a tool for studying development. They can look at what what natural human, healthy human brain tissue does versus brain tissue of a genetic disease. Um, and, and see, they can learn a great deal. And the, there's a very hopeful science that way. I think we can go forward with moral, in moral means, um, at, at least a long way, and preserve human dignity in the process. Okay, uh, thanks. I wanna ask one more question before we open it up to the audience. Um, so getting out of the details of um, how to harvest stem cells or harvest embryos for stem cell research to forecasting a future in which we do have all the consumer abilities of gene editing. Just Gattaca a thousand years from now where there are no side effects, we can choose whatever traits we want down to personality and intelligence. What is What do you foresee to be wrong in that society? Well, that's a multifaceted question, but I don't think, I, I, I have children, and I, of course I want my children to be healthy, and I want them to be free of disease, uh, and have high potential, just obviously all parents want that for their kids. But more importantly, I wanted to have children that, that I just accepted and loved, no matter who they were, because you could have a perfectly healthy child and, you know, 18 months, two years, they can have an injury. You have to, you have to love your children unconditionally. And, and I don't want it, I would never want to turn my children into products. I, I, we don't want to turn procreation into production. That would be a big mistake in my opinion. Um, for one thing, the, the traits that you might want for your kids in the time they're being conceived may not be the traits that matter 20 years later or 30 years later. That's called the flavor of the month syndrome. And, and um, the other side of it is, do we really wanna create a society with a kind of genetic competition operating? Um, I'm not, by the way, convinced that they're gonna get good results with that anyway. In fact, practically every time I talk somewhere, somebody puts up their hand and says, won't we be creating two classes of people, the rich and the poor? And I usually answer by saying, well, I think it's the poor that are going to be the lucky ones for the next several decades anyway, and maybe for longer, because their parents won't be able to afford to experiment on them. These are big experimentations. Great. Yeah, thanks a lot. No right answers, but that's why it's fun to discuss with real implications, right? So let's open up to the audience, and I think Emma is going to lead us into that. Sure. Thank you. So I hope you all decide, uh, enjoyed tonight's discussion. We will now transition to a time of question and response. 
So please use this time to reflect on tonight's discussion and how it might have challenged your viewpoints or encourage you to think more about science and faith. We also invite you to ask hard questions, so don't be shy, but please be respectful of your peers and the speakers who may have differing views. For those in the audience, please use the microphone in the middle of the theater. Uh, those physical here can, physically here can also submit a question online, and I'll try to pull up the QR code to do that. And for those joining us online, please submit your questions using the Suggest tab. Any questions? Yeah, yeah, go to the microphone, please. You may have to translate for me. Uh, yeah, sorry, can the sound guys, there's a little echo coming from the back of the stage. It makes it hard for Bill to hear the questions. Is it on? Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I read the book, uh, The Code Breaker, uh, that it described uh, gene editing and uh, all the journey of Dr. Dudna. Mm -hmm. And one of the concern that also concerned me as a molecular biologist is the presence of biohackers uh, that they are uh, trying to do CRISPR experiments in their garage. Uh, is there any regulation to stop this coming a uh, group of people uh, that uh, they are increasing, um, making people aware that the scientists are not collaborating, they, they, should, they should try these experiments in their garage because they feel uh, they want to be perfect. I'm not sure I kind of grasp the essence of that, but the biohackers are doing what? Yes, is this from a book you said, Code Breakers? Yeah. The Code Breaker, um, they described the journey of uh, Dr. Dudna about the CRISPR. So she, um, she, she explained about the presence of biohackers. Actually, if you Google, there is a person uh, that is doing CRISPR's um, technique in his garage. Okay, so maybe this is more of a question about how would you regulate the usage of CRISPR technologies because there yeah. could be, you know, third so, parties who don't really want to follow any ethical guidelines and can yeah. edit whatever edit. they want. Is there yeah. any regulation to stop these people? Yeah, well, biohacking is, I guess people can do these kind of things to themselves. It's not perhaps technically impossible. And I, I've read about some of these biohackers either proposing or actually maybe doing things. But, you know, your body is a treasure to you. I mean, you don't want to fool around with your body. I, I, I'm a physician. I believe in medicine. I want to see medicine advance. But I, I stay away from medicine as much as I can. I, I don't take medicines even for fairly trivial things. If I have a uh, 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 if I have pains, I don't take pain medicine. If I have um, congestion, I don't take decongestants myself because I, I know too much. I know that the things that you don't think can affect you are affecting you. And, and I'm a little bit extreme on that. I'm, I'm sort of, I don't get, you might say I'm the, very green in the sense that I, I believe in the natural powers of my body. And I have a very, I'm, I'm a healthy person so I don't face severe things. And when I do get seriously sick, I do use medicines. But I would never use medicines on a, what I would consider a foolish, elective adventure, um, like changing genes. We, you know, if genetics is, if you put an analogy, the genetic knowledge is the equivalent of a continent like the North America, we, we barely stepped off of Plymouth Rock. We might be halfway across Massachusetts in our genetics knowledge. We don't know that much. There are new discoveries in genetics that are coming up every month. And, and we're not nearly at the stage of where it's safe to do these kinds of interventions in most circumstances. If there's a serious disease and disability, then I think that's a reasonable thing, but not for adventure. Yeah, so were there guidelines that came out of that summit that you recently hosted with Jennifer when you brought all these researchers together? What were the common threads where the people could agree on, well, we could use these technologies to cure specific diseases but not enhance uh, human abilities? Was there a clear line that the researchers could agree on? 
I couldn't quite hear it. Just say it without the mic. Okay, I'm going to say this without the mic. Were there, were, there, were there clear guidelines from the summit that you had with Jennifer uh, that the researchers could agree on where you could apply gene editing? Yeah, to yeah, uh, yeah. What's a, what are the parameters of possibility? Well, most everybody in that conference agreed that somatic cell, body, body cells, where there were serious disorders would be a reasonable target of operation. And virtually everybody opposed, um, practically categorically, th the use of germline interventions that would be carried into the next generation. I, I had dinner with Francis Collins 10 days ago. He, he's the former head of the NIH and now is special assistant to the president. And he told me that in his opinion, the germline is a red line. We should not go there. That, that we don't need to do it. There are other ways to get around those issues. And once we do that, we open the path for all that kind of stuff I was showing you with the Dubai fertility clinic, commercial abuse of this. But there, there will be controversies in um, somatic cell gene editing too, because it's not just gonna be useful for um, curing disease. And as I said, there's a fine line between disease and enhancement. But there will also be people who just want to do things to their bodies that, to change their traits and so forth. We know that exists already. It's all over the place in our mainstream media now. And so, yes, there will be, be uh, challenging ethical questions. I, I, I think we probably should make some very pretty strong rules about this, that it, it should not be done by, by people independent of major medical centers and major medical committee decisions. Um, but even then, it's not necessarily going to be simple. All right, let's take Another. the next one from the audience. Good evening. I, uh, I just had a quick two questions, if, if that's OK. Uh, firstly, why do you think or do you believe that gene selection is less morally correct than mate selection, where if doctors dating doctors or me dating someone who's I guess tall, dark, and handsome, you know, so I could have more favorable offspring for the next generation. Why is that more morally favorable than selecting genes in that same sense? Yeah, that's a tough question. I, I, um, Desire and I have been having this back and forth all, all day about why are some things okay and their extensions through biotechnology, not okay. Yeah, the, the gamble of uh, nature's chaos, we all seem to be okay with, but it seems icky to be able to control this specific the, the randomness, yeah. So we naturally choose our mates. There's a lot of mystery in how that happens. There, you may think you know why you chose, why you feel attraction and, and end up in a relationship with somebody, you may think you understand it, but there's a lot operating that you probably didn't, were not even aware of. Um, maybe you know all this, but there's a tendency in, in human mate selection for what's called an optimal intermediate. And so people tend to be attracted to people who are like them, but not absolutely like them. In fact, particularly men like more exotic looking women, which means different from them. And there's something sort of mysterious and mystical, and that's part of the, the power of, of mate selection that goes on. Many people select their mates and have done studies on this kind of stuff that show that people select on traits they're just completely unaware of selecting for. So for example, the, the thickness of the wrist or the distance between the eyes or whether your big toe is back farther than your second toe. You ever seen that? Where, where some pe most, most people, on average anyway, the toes form a straight line and the big toe sticks out farther than the next toe over. But in a certain number of people, the, the second toe is beyond the big toe. And some people find that unattractive. It, they may not even notice that they're thinking that, but they just find it. Another one is how the elbow bends. M many people might bend straight, but, it, but there are a number of people for whom the elbow goes backwards a little bit. And, and uh, people, without even knowing it, register these things and feel this visceral 
tendency of attraction or lack of, lack of attraction. And there are genetic factors involved in that, apparently. So I, I don't, I'm, I'm just trying to say by telling you that, that there may be a lot operating in natural mate selection that we don't know, and a lot of foolishness associated with thinking we know what the genes do. So for the foreseeable centuries, I would think we won't know enough to, to select genes because even if you did, you, your genes, any gene you selected may operate differently in a given genome than it does in another genome. So it won't be simple to do. But it's a great question and there, it, it's raised on all sorts of levels. If we do some things in medicine, why not take technology and do them farther? Um, I agree. Thank you. I um, also had one more. Um, would you, are you concerned that our current thinking could be uh, human-centric or homo sapiens-centric to where we think that uh, the future generations will see ourselves as arrogant Neanderthals that are like slowing themselves down from spacefaring progress? Or like, why didn't we give ourselves stronger bones and the ability to breathe underwater seven generations <laughs> ago? You know, and, uh, and that maybe we're, we're arrogant, but also uneducated in that sense. Yeah. And looking back, we're like, not no. necessarily like educated Neanderthals. I mean, that's, that's a those are very weird prospects. And, and um, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure when the mammals went from the land back into the sea, like the, like the, um, the whales and the porpoises and stuff, they went through a lot of suffering to get a lot of suffering and death to find the individuals that would survive. I mean, I mean it, it, it's. It, if you look at an evolutionary perspective on phylogeny, it's, 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 a, it's not like simple like gene editing would produce. You, you, everything would be an experiment, and those, most of those experiments would be failures. And I think, you see, the, the, the reason that's true is because organisms are integrated unities. They operate collectively. There's not straight linear relations between most things in biology. It's more like a big network. Um, this is the field some of you know as systems biology, where, where very complex networks of interacting parts produce uh, out, outcomes. And we just don't know enough, and maybe never will be able to know enough to control that kind of um, direct guided evolution to produce superior um, performance in, in artificial environments, for example, like going back into the sea. Well, or humans space. are really bad at forecasting time, right? We have no perspective on like, cosmological time. You can't, in your life, 80 to 100 years is nothing compared to cosmological time, geological time, and even within human civilization, it really is hard to look backwards and realize how different human civilizations were back in the past. Now, that's a great insightful question because if you forecast 10,000 years from now, they will be looking back at these old policy briefs wondering, wow, they were quibbling over 14 days, plus or minus how many days to be able to test on human embryos, when the solutions, like they'll be experiencing the solutions, which are eradication of disease, right? Human flourishing, like unknown to current man, uh, harmony between, within the whole human species, right? They'll have all of that in 10,000 years and wonder, I can't believe these people were quibbling over this 14-day boundary. And I think that's why that question is really insightful, because it's hard for us to imagine what that future is going to be like. But you can kind of see how, yeah, the levels of legality and policy that we quibble over are, are nothing compared to the kinds of solutions that we can um, bring forth to, to, our, to our species. Yeah, we, oh, sorry. We have a question online. Um, oh, okay. Maybe, how much time do we have left? I'm, I'm fine. We have 12 minutes. minutes. Okay, we'll do that and then, yeah. yeah. Let, me, let me just say one more thing about that previous question. Genes don't just operate like, like you're gonna take Legos and put something together. You know, there, as I said earlier, genes, are, it's not like Mr. Potato Head where you get to you know, put on a new ear, a new nose. And it's not even like Legos, where there's specific units. It's more like a soup. And that soup bubbles through all stages of human development. So a gene that might be favorable for, you know, some desired feature in the mid-30s may also be necessary for some crucial f process in the first three days of development, for five days of development, in which case you may get 
theoretically the, the, the benefits you want, but you mess up early development. You don't want to do that. And, and so I, I think that just, there's a lot of, to my mind, imprudent thinking going on around these, this subject. I mean, I might be wrong, but I, I would bet that 200 years from now, people, the students at the University of Arkansas are going to be pretty much like you guys sitting in these seats. I, th I think it's. I think, for one thing, I think we're an amazingly refined balance of traits. And um, you think about the things an organism has to do. I mean, just you know, it has to metabolize. It has to adjust to different temperatures. It has to reproduce. It has to fight off all sorts of infections. I, I taught a course with a Nobel laureate named Baruch Blumberg, and he used to say to us, he discovered hepatitis B and figured out the vaccine. For that, I, by the way, his, I figured out when we taught our course, it was called Ethics, Epidemics, and Evolution. And I, I, I figured out that his work had saved 300 million lives by stopping hepatitis B. But Barry Blumberg used to sit, look out at our classroom and he'd say, it's not like that. It's not like they're good genes, bad genes. It's that there's a balance of genes. Genes do a lot of things, and you've got to have the right balance because there's so many challenges to being an organism. So, a little lecture on that. I, th I think we all need to calm down about this, which, by the way, I see as a good thing because I don't think we're going to advance into, it, it'll turn out to be impractical, to be imprudent. <laughs> it's, we'll have, maybe there'll be some tragedies along the line, but. I mean, there is all that stuff of eugenics, and the previous question harkens back to that very tragic episode of human history, especially in America, that then played out as the grounding for Hitler. You know, Hitler said that he looked to America, a, a society with the most advanced science for his ideas, but by the time he took them up, we'd figured out they were wrong. And they were based on very, very immature understandings, very early understandings of genetics. Remember Mendel's peas, the smooth, smooth and the rough shells and stuff? Well, those are very uncommon traits. Most genetics doesn't work the way Mendel had it figured out. And as a result, people had a very deterministic notion of genes. But in fact, genes are not as determinative as you think they are. They're, one of the great writers on this, Stephen Rose, says, there is no nuclear boardroom there is molecular egalitarianism. The whole cell and all of its different molecular components operates to produce an organism. It's not like the genes tell everybody what to do. And, and the truth of that is very evident because when they figured out how to do cloning, they took the genome of older body cells, you know, like a liver cell or a skin cell, and they put them into the egg, and lo and behold, the cytoplasm told the DNA what to do to make a baby. See, so it's, it's not like the DNA is the final word on everything. Great, we'll have one uh, question online and then we'll end with your question. So the question online uh, is, why are so many scientists religious? What was that? Why are so many scientists religious? Why are so many scientists religious? Better ask us. <laughs> um, We've actually observed the difference in which types of scientists uh, seem to have more faith representation. It seems like the psychologists and the neuroscientists are the most arrogant in denying the existence of God. And <laughs> part of it, we think, is you know when you understand basic heuristics and social psychology and how people need to connect over community to over something to survive. Uh, once you understand that as a psychologist, um, you can sort of see why faiths arise in different communities. Now, uh, I think Dr. Hurlbut would counter that the psychologists are being too arrogant because we think we understand the mechanism by which humans can uh, create myths and create meaning. Um, and your, the other argument would be that the hard scientists understand how little we know about you know, molecular bases of anything biological um, down to um, the Big Bang Theory and the gaps in what we don't understand about how the universe was generated, how matter came from nothing. So uh, I th think there is actually is a split where the psychologists, people like me, are the most arrogant in denying the existence of God, and uh, the hard scientists can s know what they don't know, and it's a lot. Yeah, well, I, I've 
met a lot of scientists that I've talked about religion with, and I've known several Nobel laureates who were very deeply Christian, Charles Towns being one of the most prominent. He discovered the laser. And uh, the guy I just mentioned a few minutes ago, Baruch Blumberg, Barry Blumberg, he was Jewish, but he very decisively believed there was a God. Um, and I've known numerous other scientists who were religious. I've also known quite a few scientists who find religion kind of um, a, a discordant category of discussion. They, they, their whole focus of their lives is on the material operations, and they have a very mechanistic view of how life operates, or anything operates, how nature operates. But there's a, there's a quote from a guy named Burroughs, I can't remember his first name, it says, after science has done its best, the mystery remains. And I think the physicists know that. Physicists tend to be more likely to be religious, chemists next, biologists less, psychologists less, sociologists even less. But, but I think it's a, a sort of a disposition of focus. I, I, I'm trained in biology and I've thought about, I'm a practicing Christian. I became a Christian when I was an undergraduate at Stanford. Um, and I, I find my faith very compelling. I, and I've, I want to know the truth, I want to live by the truth. And I, I believe that I'm doing so. I just think that if you stop and you ask yourself, what does science really know and how does it know it? Science, scientific knowledge is like a little island in a great sea of, of truth. It's one way of knowing. Empirical studies are, are one way of knowing, but um, there are other ways to know it. The, the, um, the, I think it was a chemist, Michael Pogliani has a book called Personal Knowledge where he says that, that there's some things you just don't know other than through personal interactions and there's no testing for them exactly, but you know them. And, and so it's what he calls personalistic knowledge. And I, I just think we, when we use the reductive and analytic mode of empirical science, we can arrive at very interesting and important truths which, to my mind, bear witness to a creator in the sense that they, are, they re reflect a, a, a world operated by uniform principles and, and not just arbitrary unknowables. Um, science, Einstein himself said the most, most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. And the mathematician Eugene Weiner said that, that uh, it spoke of the, something like the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. So not only is the, is the world ordered in a way that reflects a creator in, in the interpretation of many religious people, but it's ordered in such a way that human beings can understand a great deal about it and operate within it as co-creators of benevolent advance and creative benevolent creativity. And I think in my own profession, I take it as an imperative that we, we look into the book of nature um, within the guidance of the, the book of scripture and we, we operate in a way that contains that sense of our science within the larger overview of what we can know through our spiritual lives. That way it'll be used in, in its deepest and largest context of morality, but we'll also take the benefits of an amazing, um, amazing world that has so many untapped potentials in it. I'm, I must say, I'm, I'm always amazed by what is possible if we use our intelligence and, and collectively cooperate to an inquire of the natural world what can happen. Medicine is a great example of it. Just but all sorts of things, I mean, phenomenal possibilities are no doubt yet untapped. We need to have the cooperative sociality that can, can allow that and the attitude toward the natural world that can allow it. And there's a very good case to be made that it's the Christian foundations of the Western civilization that have brought forth modern science. So there's quite a few good writings on that. So I, I don't think we as Christians need to apologize for our faith in, in any, any measure or any degree in the face of scientific advance.